Good evening, church. We are back in the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, I want to jump right into it. That's Daniel chapter 9. We will be looking only at verses 1 through 3 because we're going to look at the first P in this magnificent prayer from Daniel. The first P is preparation of heart. And as we just praised our God, we used music and even singing out lyrics to break up what could be hardness of heart the plow of worship helps prepare my heart to receive the seed of God's word. The next P that we will eventually get to, I promise, in Daniel 9 is praise, the praise of prayer. And you start out with a God of sovereignty and you place him in his rightful place over all of the world, over all of creation, over everything according to the scriptures. And then we move into the heart of the prayer, which is ultimately penance. Daniel, he intercedes on behalf of his people, and he feels the weight of the sin of the land and the desolation of the land, and he ends with a petition. And we're going to look at those Ps eventually, but what I want to do, something I don't usually do up front, we usually cover it verse by verse, and we take it as it comes, and we'll do that, but what I want you to hear in its entirety so that you hear the heart of Daniel's prayer I want to read it. So if you would bear with me, if you have scriptures in your hand, I would love for you to look at the verses with me. We'll begin in verse 4 in Daniel 9. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us, belong shame of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and because we have sinned against you, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. It says, as Daniel continued petitioning and praying and confessing, the angel Gabriel 
shows up with a message, an answer to the prayer. But the answer comes in the form of a prophecy. And we're going to spend some weeks looking at that prophecy. But before we get to the prophecy, let me give you the summation of Daniel 9. The prayer is in regards to the 70 weeks that the Jews are in captivity in Babylon. The answer, the prophecy, is in regards to 70 weeks of years, which comes out to 490 years, and we'll talk about that. The prayer is in regard to, ultimately, restoration for Israel. The answer, ultimate restoration for all. They call Daniel chapter 9 the backbone of Bible prophecy. Why? Because in the prophecy, which is the answer to this prayer of contrition, this prayer of intercession, this prayer of repentance, we see a prophecy that deals with the first coming of Christ, the sacrifice of the cross. We see the coming of the Antichrist and the eventual second coming of Jesus Christ, all in a timeline. Now, interestingly, as we dive into this prayer and the details that surround the prayer, you're going to notice that Daniel's prayer is generated by the word of God. Because he knew the scriptures, because he knew prophecy, because he knew the signs and the times that he was living in, he had an awareness of what was happening around him. So he reaches out to heaven for God to act and hear and listen and forgive. And I'm saying if there's ever a time in our lives that we should be praying to God about the condition of our land, it's now. This prayer is worthy of our meditation, which means think deeply upon it. It's worthy of our imitation. If you ever don't know what to pray, turn to Daniel 9 and begin reading the word as your prayer on your behalf to God. Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, or Darius, if you want to pronounce it incorrectly, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. All right, before we get into what he's reading and what he sees, I want to talk about how these timestamps, these timelines written as if Daniel was documenting a journal in the first year of Darius. Now we have a timeline that tells us where he's at in human history. And interestingly, Daniel has been at this in ministry in Babylon for over 65 years at this point. He's perhaps entering into his mid 80s. So he's advanced in age. Remember, he was 15 years old when taken as a teenager from his homeland, Jerusalem, into captivity in Babylon. That was Daniel chapter 1. So what I wanted to do was put together a timeline so you could see if Daniel is made from the same stuff as us, he has a history. And it's in hindsight where he's able to look back and see how far he's come while, look at me, connecting the dots of his life with the scriptures and coming to a discerning conclusion about what God wants him to do in the midst of his circumstances. Daniel chapter 1, the exile to Babylon. That is 605 BC. Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That was the statue that was made up of various metals. We talked about that. I've labored to make sure you understood the details of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8. So if this is your first time joining us in Daniel chapter 9, I don't know what to tell you. Go backwards, listen to the messages, meet us back in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 3 is this golden image, perhaps in response to the, the dream he had in Daniel 2, he constructs a golden image as if to say, I know I was the head of gold in the dream, but now I'm going to construct an image of gold and command the people to bow down to the image. That's when we're introduced to such bold faith from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, unwilling to compromise their conviction, unwilling, I love this part, to bow down to the world around them because they had already bowed their knee to the God above them. Daniel chapter 4 King Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, 
Remember, it came in the form of a dream. Daniel interprets it. We see a seven-year period of King Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation. He returns, and I titled that message, The Inaugural Address from the King, because he makes this proclamation about the God of Daniel. That's the one true God. You want to talk about a radical transformation? Because previously, he said, look how great I am. Look how great Babylon is. Babylon the great. And then God got a hold of his heart. I believe we'll see King Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Daniel chapter 4 chronologically, ready, goes to Daniel 7. Chronologically. Now, we didn't cover it that way. We went to Daniel chapter 5, but chronologically, Daniel chapter 7 begins with a time stamp. It's 553 BC. It's the beginning of the king Belshazzar, who was the final king in the Babylonian empire. We see a dream there as well for beasts and heaven's court. Then chapter 8 is two years later. That's where we just exited recently. I labored to explain the vision and the dream with the ram and the goat and the goat's single horn, which was Alexander the Great, which was broken and four horns rose up in his place, which was the four generals of the, the Grecian Empire. And eventually out of the Seleucid family or the Seleucid dynasty came Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a picture of, a pattern, a shadow of the eventual Antichrist. And then, of course, Daniel chapter 5 on the timeline is 539 BC. That's when Babylon fell. That is when the handwriting on the wall, which we use as an expression today, say you can't see the handwritings on the wall. And I've said, you can't read the handwriting that is on the wall in our present society. God is as, as if he's showing us exactly what's happening. And the Christians and the church needs to respond. Daniel chapter 9, which is where we're at right now, is 538 BC. They're 67 years into their captivity. This is a prayer from Daniel, which rolls over to an answer, which is a prophecy, which we'll get to. And then surprisingly, Daniel chapter 6 is Daniel in the lion's den. The most famous story out of the book of Daniel. Did you know it falls that far into the chronologically, chronological of Daniel? Pretty cool, right? Now, why do I go through all that? One, as a review. Two, because I'm convinced Daniel had a biblical awareness. He knew exactly what was happening. He probably, in light of the visions and the dreams that he documented, that he was given the ability to interpret, I guarantee you, he starts to connect the dots and going, wait a second. The king's dream of the golden head, which was Babylon, which eventually was destroyed by the silver, well, Babylon has fallen. And now the Medo-Persian Empire is replacing them. He's probably starting to make the connection. He probably knew the prophet Isaiah's prediction about a man named Cyrus. Now, if Daniel's the last man standing from the Babylon Babylonian Empire, and now he's a high official in the Medo-Persian Empire, pretty remarkable because God never leaves himself without a witness. And one thing a conquering kingdom would do is dispose of and get away and, and, and cancel out everybody that was part of the previous administration, but not Daniel. So he's starting to hear their main king is a guy named Cyrus. And our scriptures have him named. He's starting to have an awareness, church, which led to, which is the point of my message tonight, a brokenness. See, the greater your biblical awareness, the deeper your spiritual brokenness. Let me define biblical awareness for us. Biblical awareness is having an understanding of the word of God. It starts there, right? So intellectually, theologically, I can connect the dots. I know the scriptures. I might not know it all. I'm beginning to see how prophecy it works itself out in my present day. I see how the past prophecies, which were fulfilled, have some connection to future prophecies. I'm starting to get it in my mind, in my head, but it doesn't stop there because it has to go somewhere after it gets to your head. It's got to descend and make its way to your, your heart. So it's not just about understanding the word of God. It's also about standing under the God of the word, submitting to his lordship. Because I know a lot of people who have a lot of information and a lot of intellect up here, and they know the Bible very well, but for some reason, what's up here has not made its way in here. That's biblical awareness. Christians need to know the word so that we can have awareness of what's happening in our day. 
Spiritual brokenness can be defined as sensitivity to the spirit. Sensitivity to the spirit, which goes like this. I'm sensitive to the spirit and I recognize my sinfulness. My sinfulness in light of God's holiness. And I'm sensitive to that. And I don't want to lose sight of that sensitivity. That I was a sinner saved by grace, now made a son, made a daughter, and you had nothing to do with it. And then that births in me humility. I go from sensitivity to the spirit about my sinfulness in light of his holiness, and now I have humility. Humility in light of his faithfulness and his forgiveness. Who am I that you would choose to forgive me? What do I have to offer in return? That's brokenness. And with those two, sensitivity and humility, guess what happens? Empathy. You begin to feel what God feels. Your heart begins to break for what breaks God's heart. Empathy to the lost world around you. To begin to feel their pain. And lest we get up on our holy high horse and look at a broken and fractured world and think that we're better than them, we were just like them. We were there. So I need empathy to remind myself that the gospel that saved my soul is the only power that can save any soul. So I lead with love, but I never neglect or compromise the truth. You can read the scriptures and there are certain people during certain times, times of ruin, that God began to stir up because he looks for a man or a woman, not a man or a woman who are great in and of themselves. He looks for a man or a woman who, are, who would dare to prove that he is great. And Nehemiah was one of those men, a prophet. Sometime after the period of Daniel, the exiles are sent back under the orders of Cyrus the Great. And now they have worked on rebuilding the temple. Yet, a report comes to Nehemiah in the first chapter, and the report goes like this. The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Verse 4, so it was when I, Nehemiah, heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Verse 5, and the several verses thereafter are this amazing prayer, just like the one I read in Daniel 9. You'll see an amazing prayer of confession in Nehemiah chapter 9. There's interesting, if you want to remember, great prayers of the Old Testament. It's Daniel 9, it's Nehemiah 9, and it's Ezra 9. All chapter 9s. Amazing prayers of contrition. Ezra, a contemporary of Nehemiah, he too, in the ninth chapter, he would say this amazing prayer on behalf of the people. But before he says this prayer, in verses four to six, listen to this. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me. This is Ezra. Because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. He sat in his grief. When was the last time we were so broken that we sat and contemplated how we have sinned against the holy God. It says in verse 5, At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, and having torn my garment and my robe, outward expression, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I too ashamed and humiliated to lift my face up to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. And he continues. This is the anguish of the prophets of old when they looked out at a land that was desolate, that was broken, when they heard of gates and walls being broken down physically. And I'm saying we are seeing that same exact ruins in our land, spiritually. Walls are broken down. Gates are on fire, spiritually. And the walls that once represented faith and family and freedom, the wall of faith that we used to identify ourselves with the God of the Bible, our entire country. 
It was the faith in God that was a wall of protection and provision. And that wall lays in ruin. Faith has been pushed out of the public space. Truth, the Bible, the gospel, they are offensive. The Bible's outdated. Faith is no longer necessary. We are no longer one nation under God. We are one nation under fog. The wall of family, which built upon the wall of faith, of course, it brings stability. Families that were built on biblical principles, it brought stability. And I do not have to go on any tangent to convince you in this room how the family is currently under attack and it lays in ruins. The biblical model and the biblical foundation of a family that brought security and stability is currently under attack. And ultimately, if faith is in ruins and family is in ruins, freedom, as defined by God. In case you didn't know this, government is in place in the American context not to give us our freedoms. God gives us our freedoms. Government is in place to uphold those freedoms. And a people of faith have the virtue to govern themselves. That's the point. And that is what the forefathers wrote into our governmental infrastructure. In the words of John Adams, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. It won't work. If the word of God is not the absolute truth, if the principles and the values of the scriptures are not the driving influence on society, God being a perfect gentleman, when pushed out, he bows to our sinful nature and he goes away and it's a vacuum and it's filled with godlessness. I've said it before, you don't want, God says you don't want God, you don't want me in this space, that's fine, I'll put a godless leader in my place. That's what you wanted. With walls broken down, the people who are supposed to be protected by those walls, they're going to be broken down. It's going to be broken people, lost people. We are in the midst of a month that uses a word that the Bible calls an abomination. We call it Pride Month. Now, in case your mind just went directly to the LGBT community, I want to be quick to say it's not about them. It's about sinful humanity that takes a word that the Bible says pride goes before destruction and we flaunt it in God's face and it's not about homosexuality and it's not about heterosexuality and it's not about pansexuality and transsexuality and bisexuality. It's about anyone who flaunts their sexuality as if that is their primary identity to a holy God. And all of us need to repent from our pride. All of us. Pride says, I don't need you, God. And my primary identity is going to be in something else. When walls are broken down, of course, progressivism is going to take root. Progressivism is basically a disguise for paganism. Moral relativism, have at it, believe whatever you want to believe, your truth, her truth, my truth. And I'm going, all of that, it's God's truth. And God's truth defines human sexuality and morality. God's truth defines it. And when we don't want God's truth to define it, walls are broken down and we are left in ruin. From pride to progress to eventual privilege. What a word. Okay, so I recently got done speaking somewhere and somebody reached out to me afterwards and they said, Pastor Matt, amazing message, want to share it with my network. Do you know if they recorded that? So I went to the Facebook page of the venue I was just at and I saw a picture of me announcing the event. So they obviously did not live stream. And then I saw a comment. So I decided to click on it, see what the comment was. And it said, you booked a white supremacist. <laughs> and I said, wow, this how dare this church? Until I discovered they were talking about me. 
So I go, okay, let's see what type of person this is. I would like to, you know, so I click on their profile picture and it takes me to a page. And of course, now in hindsight, I see it and it's a white guy. And I go back to the comment and it says, you booked a white supremacist. And I go, interesting, says a white guy supremely <laughs> who doesn't know me. Then I clicked on his Facebook page and I found out he works for an organization called Be The Bridge. And Be The Bridge is a ministry that centers on, ready, racial reconciliation. So here's his attempt at building a bridge, even though it's a broken bridge, to try to reconcile race, and he's calling somebody that he doesn't know a white supremacist. But the idea behind Be The Bridge, this racial reconciliation and the resources that they offer to the churches, because they claim to know God, let me read directly from their website with a resource that they offer anybody that is interested in racial reconciliation. And one of their courses is called Whiteness Intensive, Understanding the Construct of Whiteness. The Whiteness Intensive is our most in-depth online offering to, to understand the construct of whiteness through a series of eight courses taught by a diverse group of Be The Bridge educators. We come to understand the history of whiteness, how it shapes systems, structures, relationships, and culture, as well as you personally. This values-based course is suitable to use in any setting, while a faith-based component is also available if you would like to use the course in your church or other Christian faith space. Now, in case you have no idea what I'm talking about, the tool they're talking about is called critical race theory. Critical race theory, if you're a white man that is working the curriculum, you have to claim repentance for your whiteness. Now, I just kind of want to unpack this so you understand how ridiculous this is. You got a, a white guy who's saying he needs to repent for being white. And if you're a person of color, you are automatically oppressed. I'm sorry to hear that. I want to apologize to you, my brother, for my white privilege. I realize I have white privilege because of the, my skin color, and I repent. Do you forgive me? Because you're always in the oppressive class. Who's the white supremacist in that equation? Shouldn't it be called critical race theory? It should be called hypocritical race theory. Why am I touching on this? Because when walls in a land are broken down, and that type of demonic doctrine enters into the church, and people are now, with a general brush, putting people in categories based on their race. Now we look at skin as opposed to looking at sin. Want to talk about be the bridge? I did time with white supremacists who had tattoos of burning crosses and swastikas on their forehead. And you know what built a bridge between that guy and the people of color? The Bible, as I administered the word of God every day in jail. And there are people watching online who did time with me. And they're saying amen through the screen because they knew it's true. And then you would see a white supremacist, a true white supremacist who hated people of color playing basketball or handball in the yard with the very people he claimed to hate. And the true bridge was the word of God. Amen. See, people of all colors are currently the victims of oppression, injustice, and racism as a result of woke supremacy, not white supremacy. White supremacy has no power in our country. Racism is very real, in case people try to hear what I did not say, but the only power that can break the sin of racism is the gospel. Amen. No other tool can be used analytically to help bridge the gap between races. And at the end of the day, true repentance is contrite, not contrived. You don't manufacture repentance. It's not something you can emotionally draw out of people. It's not something you can guilt them into. Repentance is from your soul, from your heart, when you recognize you've sinned against the holy God. It's not contrived, it's contrite. It's brokenness. It's anguish. Now, some of us can't relate to some of these large-scale sins. 
We're detached, we're despondent, we're apathetic, we're lethargic. We can't relate to that. Yeah, I see it on the news, but it doesn't touch my sweet, comfortable home. And I'm saying to you, with all sincerity in my heart, you need to repent from your lack of repentance. Many of us in this room, we need to repent tonight from the lack of our awareness that we need to repent. We've never done business with God if we're being real about our Christian walk. We've never repented in anguish and and cried over our sin. If you've ever had a tragedy strike you unexpectedly, such circumstances in life can drop you to your knees, can take the wind out of you. I've been there. And even those experiences, they should pale in comparison to the weight of sin that I hold and that Christ took from me. David wrote in the midst of a psalm of contrition, he wrote this, for you do not desire sacrifice, God, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. See, to know the Lord's heart is to feel the world's hurt. To know the heart of the Lord is to feel the hurt of the world. Now you're like, wait a second. I thought we were in the book of Daniel. Where are you going? See, it says Daniel understood the books. Verse 2a, I understood the books. And I couldn't even get past that phrase because I know Daniel's position in this current administration. And he's been at it for several decades. He's a busy man. If there was ever somebody with an excuse of having a busy schedule, it may have been Daniel. And yet in the midst of his busy schedule, Daniel's busyness does not lead to barrenness. Daniel finds time to get in the book. And why should every Christian get in the book? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be put to shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. That word expresses energy. To present yourself, which means in, in God's sight, I want to present myself transparent and open before him, and I'm going to know his word, and I'm going to cut it straight. I'm going to rightly divide it. I got to get into it so that it cuts me straight, so that I can cut it straight, and I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of presenting the truth. There's no shame in anything I say from this pulpit. I have prayed over this message. I've prepared my heart. And I trust the answer is from the Lord, from my tongue. The word of truth is the workman's tool for building. Building the kingdom, the word of truth. The word of truth is the workman's tool for measuring. Measuring the signs of the times. I know exactly where I'm at in human history in light of knowing the word of truth. The word of truth helps us repair God's people. It is the only power that can save a soul. We need to know the truth so well because we are the ones that interpret the truth to the world around us that doesn't know God. It's your life. Paul says, you are an epistle of Christ written on the hearts of men. You may be the only Bible somebody reads. Paul said, imitate me because I'm imitating him. If you're looking for somebody to hit your eyes to, he says, watch me. Watch how I live because I'm watching him. There should be no excuses for us. We obviously pursue what we value. If you look at your week, where you spend your time, where you spend your money, where you spend your energy, does any of that time get committed to the word of God? What did Daniel read in the books? It says he read the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he's reading the prophet Jeremiah. There are two passages in the prophet Jeremiah, the scrolls, the scriptures, that he would have read this exact number. Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass, when 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I'm going to use Babylon to punish my people, and then I'm going to turn the punishment on Babylon. And, and Daniel's reading this, and he's doing the math. 
He's sitting in the 67th year of captivity and he's going, 70 years is allotted by God? It's the 67th year since we've been here. I was 15 in 605. Now I'm serving the king in 539 BC. This is about to happen. Why were they in captivity? Quick review. Remember, they had neglected the Sabbath year. Every seventh year, they were supposed to let the land rest. Work it for six, let it rest for the seventh. For 490 years, they neglected that law. So God said, because you owe me every seventh year for 490 years, that comes out to 70 years, 490 divided by, you see it? Yeah. Okay, 70 years. But there was another thing they were supposed to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, it said at the end of that seventh year, they were supposed to gather all the people, moms and dads and children, and even foreigners that lived in the land, gather them together. Guess what they did? Read the word of the Lord to remind every single person of God's truth. They neglected that. So because they neglected truth, they followed lies. And God said, you want idolatry? I will put you in the birthplace of idolatry for 70 years. So Daniel's reading this. He perhaps even read two chapters later in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. That's Jerusalem. For here, here's the, the famous verse in Jeremiah 29. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Are you seeing this? Daniel's connecting the dots. He's doing his math. He knows that 70 years has been appointed by God. God is about to do something after the 70th year. So that's that. Shut your Bible. God's going to do it. God's will be done. And sadly, many people use God's will be done as an excuse not to do God's will. Oh, I hear it all the time. This world is not our home, true. We're just passing through, true. So I'm going to sit off on the sidelines and allow my children to go through the public school system, which is an indoctrination camp, and they're leaving on the other side of that completely confused and completely jacked up and completely messed up. But we're just passing through here. God's will be done. Imagine, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, if I use that same exact response to my time in prison, the time that I would exit was set in stone. It wasn't 70 years, but I knew when I was going home. The time that was appointed for me to leave that place was August 3rd, 2014. I entered January 7th, 2010. Imagine, if you will, if I said, you know what? I'm not going to be living here. This place is not my home. I'm just passing through. And I just stayed in isolation, off by myself, didn't interact with the world around me. I want to have stories of salvation and fruitfulness from faith. And you better believe every square inch of that place I wanted to impact for the gospel. Yeah. Every inch of it. No excuses. This world is just the way it is. But when the Christians understand they're the salt of the earth and we engage a decaying culture, we delay it for a time until he decides to pull back the veil. But in the meantime, I don't want to say God's will be done as an excuse not to do God's will. And neither does Daniel. He could have closed it and coasted into the 70th year. He doesn't. Why? I believe with all my heart, he read the next few verses in Jeremiah. He reads about the 70 years, and then he reads this in verses 12 to 14. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I dr have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away. Captain. Mind you, he reads it, 70 years, is determined, and then he keeps reading it. It says, then you will call upon me, and he takes it personal. He does. I will call upon you, and what does he do? Verse 3, then I set my face toward the Lord God, 
to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. The word then is connected to the previous scripture that says he understood by the books the number 70 was appointed by God through the prophet Jeremiah. Then he set his face. In other words, his prayer was generated by the word of God. And you might not have any words to pray if you don't know the word of God. That's why there is a high importance on knowing the book. There is no word that can prevail like God's word in the throne room of grace. I pray the word. God cannot deny what he has supplied. So I pray the word. Then I set my face toward, toward. He cuts off all distractions. He silences all other voices. He positions his heart towards heaven. He shuts the door on the world and he opens the window to heaven. And he places such conviction and resolution, which always gives way to germination. Something's being born in the heart that sets it towards heaven. He set his face. Now remember, in Daniel 8, there was this other idea behind Antiochus Epiphanes setting his face, right? He had fierce features. He set his face to destroy the Jewish system and the Jews. Then Jesus also set his face like a flint to Jerusalem to bring salvation. And if I believe that he laid down his life for me, then I too should set my face to be about my father's business. And with passion, Notice then, grounded by the word of God, his prayer. Grounded, excuse me, by the will of God. Then towards, 1 John 5, 14 says this. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Prayer must be generated by the word of God, grounded by the will of God, yeah, God's will is going to be done. After 70 years, he's going to set the captives free. Yet that does not stop Daniel from identifying himself with God's will. I pray not so I can get something from God. I pray so I can get in on something with God to align my life with God's will. And when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, God, the Father, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will your will be done. And there was a proclamation that he wanted his father's will over his feelings, over his flesh. He wanted his father's will. Prayer, of course, generated by the word of God, grounded by the will of God. And watch this, germinated by the work of God. It's a work of the Lord to germinate passion and anguish, and brokenness cannot be manufactured. It's the weight of the Holy Spirit that is crushing us to squeeze out of us a glory that should be ascribed to God. It's through brokenness that God does his greatest work. It's not through men and women who have it all together. In fact, it's through men and women who are willing to be undone in the presence of their God. The Old Testament prophets, they called the people to repentance. You can follow this historical line of contrition all the way through. It doesn't stop at the early church. In fact, they too carried the message of repentance. You can go through our church history and it will literally take you, guess where? It will take you on an excursion through the Middle East, through Europe, eventually cut off from that continent, makes its way across the Atlantic Ocean, is birthed in a new land that was called New England. And the pilgrims who came across, did you know that before they set out on their journey, they declared a fast? 
And they asked for God's blessing upon the journey. And when they touched down on the shore, the first thing they did was declare a fast publicly, a public display of humiliation, asking God for his blessing upon this journey. And one of the early pilgrim fathers recorded in a journal saying this of the father that, that got off the boat, said, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before God and seek of him a right way for us Fasting and public humiliation did not stop there. In fact, it continued. It helped frame the governing documents of our country. You can't get away from, not only through the 1700s, but through the very days and weeks and months and years of what was known as the Revolutionary War, where they were calling out to God for his blessing. And you can literally list the dates. June 1st, 1774, 1775, 1776. All of these colonies and their governors proclaiming publicly a time of prayer and fasting when they were on verge of war with France. They, they, they declared a public day of humiliation and fasting. President John Adams, May 9th, 1798. Again, on March 6th, 1799. President James Madison, January 12th, 1815. Public day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. President Zachary Taylor declared August 3rd, 1849, a day of national fasting to which E.D. McMaster, a famous minister, said these words. For first of all, doubtless, our duty is that we call to recollect, recollection each one his own personal sins. And with deep humiliation and confession before God, we turn from them, imploring him, his divine mercy, to pardon us. It is also our duty to call to remembrance and confess before God the sins of our people and our nation, and to make intercession and supplication for their pardon at the throne room of grace. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln, he called the nation to a public humiliation of fasting and prayer. On one of those days, a minister by the name of Charles Porter, he said this, the present national fast implies this, that somehow things are not right with us. And it is our duty as far as possible to set them right before God. Do you wonder why I brought up the National Day of Prayer recently? Asking this church to understand the only right response to our soul and our society's sinfulness, the only right response is repentance. David Wilkerson a minister not too long ago. He said this, quote, when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would find a man and baptize him in, in anguish. When's the last time you've been baptized in anguish? When's the last time you repented? When's the last time you got on your knees just cried out to God and asked for fresh forgiveness. When's the last time? When's the last time you got on your face? You ever done that? When's the last time you begged God's pardon? I think we take it for granted. Daniel prayed a broken prayer for a broken people. And if there was ever one in the scriptures other than Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our God, not one mention of a failure, of a mar, of a mistake, of an error, not one. Joseph and Daniel. And yet this prophet of old he wanted to identify himself with the sins of his people and his land. And I'm looking at a room filled with a couple hundred people and I'm asking, imagine if we actually 
believe that God can revive and he can turn it around and we're going to trust for his will to be done. But while we trust his will to be done, we're going to partner with him to do his will because I want to be a part of the work of God. And it starts with me going first and being willing to have anguish and brokenness and repent and not care what people around me think to find my identity in the one true king, not my sexuality, to find my identity in the one true king, not my ethnicity, to find that he He's the wall of protection that surrounds me and I got to stop caring about what the world thinks. I preached like this because I honestly believe there is no tomorrow. Lord willing, if he were to call me home, I wouldn't want people to come to a podium and say, Matt was a great minister. No, I want you to play my last message to show the world where my heart was. If the Holy Spirit is moving things around in your soul right now. Would you respond? Would you stop playing church? This is comfortable. Would you get out of your seat? Would you come to the altar? This is a place of sacrifice. I say it all the time. Sometimes, sometimes just getting up out of my own comfort zone is the liberty that I needed to experience. Sometimes throwing my hands in the air during praise and worship, which for men, a lot of us, we can't do. It's hard. We're stoic. It's not, that's not the way I'm wired, I say. It's not my disposition, I say. And, and, and here's the crazy part about that is I used to sit behind my parents at church and I watched my mom first raise her hands and I used to think, that's so weird. I didn't get how intimate she was with her creator and her maker. And then I thought my father was the most stoic man that I knew. He was always reserved, always calm, always cool, always collected, always measured. And I never saw him raise his hands in church. But something happened in his soul and he buried a son and it was in the midst of brokenness and anguish where I watched my father transform and now when I stand back there and I see my father on earth raise his hands to the most high God I think about brokenness and it's beautiful in the sight of our God what about you when's the last time you were broken so if that's you you come you come to this altar and you do business with your God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray your Holy Spirit falls upon hearts that may be dead or dull, hearts that may be calloused over by worldly things. I pray you break it by the power of your word that men and women will repent tonight on behalf of their sin and our land sin. That eyes would be opened, that your Holy Spirit would begin to maneuver, and do work in our hearts, do surgery from young to old, your gospel is glorified. Your good news is the only power that can save. Oh God, call them to this altar in the name of Jesus.